Welcome, everyone, to the Bridgestone Canadian Superbike Championship podcast. Not just for the pros. Not just for the pros. Uh, thank you to Cam Bickle for hopping on with me here. Cam had a great idea. Uh, we have not done enough on this podcast for uh, all things outside of the Economy Lube entire uh, pro sport bike division and of course the gp bikes pro Superbike feature class we were joking about that on the round six recap with myself and colin fraser earlier this week uh basically saying like yeah we, everybody at the top end of those two classes has kind of squeezed all the air out and it's like well we, we could sit here and do a three-hour podcast on every single class because there's great racing up and down the grid in all of these different classes all throughout the year but I don't think anybody would want to listen to a three-hour podcast of Colin and I just going, okay, next class, rattle it off. Next class, rattle it off. So uh, I'm very glad that Cam Bickle, of course, of CSBK.ca uh, and many more ventures has uh, convinced me. He had to, he really had to twist my arm yeah, on this one. He took a lot of convincing. <laughs> now you walked up to me and you said, hey, why don't, why don't we talk about like everything that's not pro sport bike and pro super bike? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, we should be doing that. So uh, first, before we get going here, I would just like to say thank you to you, Cam, because uh, I've been also talking about this on uh, some of our other Bridgestone CSPK podcasts. You make me sound so much smarter than I actually am. Oh, my God. I, I just copy and paste whatever you write on CSPK.ca, and then I, I regurgitate it on TSN, and then people are like, wow, he's really good at calling races. He has so much information. And I'm like, eh. Well, I actually just put all my work into one of those like AI generators, like <laughs> chat GPT or whatever. So whatever it spits out is, uh, is yeah, I just sit back with my feet up all day and then put something into an AI website. No, you did an awesome job uh, again this year. I guess before we dive into all of this, let me just ask you, how uh, did this year compare or feel for you compared to previous years of covering all of these classes? Uh, definitely busier, uh, a lot busier, but that's a good problem. Right, like it's it's good when you have a lot of action going on in a lot of classes and a lot of new names and great battles and we saw a lot of different uh, a lot of different you know trends in in each class which were a lot to follow and a lot to keep up with especially when you're trying to focus on superbike and sport bike uh, pro superbike pro sport bike but um, yeah it was a fun year there was there was a lot of a lot of really good stuff to, to kind of keep an eye on throughout the year and it, it's going to be good to kind of talk about it a little bit now. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start things off uh, by going in, in your idea again, like most things are. Uh, we decided to go from kind of the uh, the bigger bikes down to the smaller ones. So we begin with the Aim Insurance Amateur Superbike Championship. What are your thoughts? My, my thoughts are what a year from before in Radisic. Yeah. Uh, and, and truthfully, like, I don't mean this in any disrespectful way to Goran, but if you said kind of the year that he was going to have coming into the year, like, I think we all could have seen a scenario where he was going to be the champion. He'd, he'd win a couple of races. Uh, you know, he was always a guy that was near the front, very consistently kind of knocking on the door. And last year he switched from a Ducati to a BMW and it seemed to, to be very comfortable for him. So I think we could have seen a scenario where Goran did come into the year and was the champion. But if I told you that he did 10 races and every single one of them, he was first or second, and basically had a shot at history going into the last round. I mean, I, I think Goran would have even been surprised by that. But it's uh, it, it, it's a cool story, I think, for the whole paddock. Because he's a guy that's kind of been chipping away at it for a while and, and making some progress. I mean, we all get caught up in the, the Ryan Beattie that kind of show up and are just instantly very, very fast. And we'll talk about him later. But um, I think that the season that Goran put together for that PMR Paul McDonald Racing BMW team was was definitely the story. Uh, you know, obviously the champion is going to be the story, but how he he went about doing that was pretty incredible. I really enjoyed seeing Goran go out uh, and and be competing uh, in the GP Bikes Pro Superbike Feature Class in Shannonville, and the reason for that was twofold. One, you love to see people jump up, and I love that our final rounds are often over the last couple of years and beyond, like it's people just jumping up and testing things. And maybe, you know, Seb's on a number one plate instead of a 24 and it's whatever it, it's, it's, it just feels different as we're winding things down, which I honestly love about this sport, but also because of MotoGP and world Superbike and all these things where you're typically seeing like teams, right? These two bikes on the grid to actually see Paul McDonald out there with the same look of the bike that Goran Radisic had out there, it really did feel like, okay, there's the Kawasaki's, right? We got Connor Campbell out there alongside Jordan. Okay, here's the BMWs. We got Sam Garan and and uh, and Ben Young. And you start going down through it, still waiting for that Honda teammate. We'll see when that shows up. Maybe, maybe if Nickerson wants to team up, maybe with uh, with uh, David McKay, we'll see where that goes in the future. But, uh, but I love the fact that we had Radisic out there alongside Paul McDonald. And as much as you know, they weren't necessarily fighting to the top end of the grid. It just gave that kind of overall depth and strength of the field, it felt like. Yeah, for sure. And both of them had uh, had 
pretty good weekends. Paul's, you know, speaking to him a little bit, he's very bummed about how his weekend went, but um, you know, he was up in, in the top five at the start of the race, which yeah. would have been a career best finish. So uh, obviously that program, you know, with, with Goran and with Paul had a lot of success this year. I think Matt Simpson deserves a lot of credit for that behind the scenes. Uh, Goran leaned on Scott Karche a lot, uh, who obviously helps Ben Young's program. Uh, so Goran had a few people helping him out, uh, Matt primarily running that team. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the credit goes to the guy twisting the throttle and, uh, and Goran, you know, he, he got up on the podium at CTMP and he kind of summed it up, you know, not just what he went through, what all these guys go through, but, you know, you have coast to coast, you have rain, you have heat, you have crashes, you have injuries, you have repairs, you have, you know, all these things. And, um, you know, this part he didn't say, but to come out of that finishing, you know, first or second, no matter what you threw at him, no matter where he started on the grid or whatever problems he was fighting through is uh is really something that we we've never seen in, in amateur superbike and it uh it's he's sort of hinted that he might not be around next year you know he doesn't really know what his plans are going to be and it would be a shame uh coming off the season that he had but regardless uh, it's going to go down as a pretty incredible season what did you make of tyler brew and tyrone Tavares being on yamaha throughout the season for a year in which we only really saw Tommy Cassis on the grid in the last couple of rounds on a Yamaha, but in amateur superbike, the Yamahas were strong. Oh yeah. And Brewer's got to be like the most underrated rider yeah. of the season, I think, because he was a, a pretty much consistent podium runner the entire season as well. Uh, and the fact that despite all the success that Goran had and all the you know incredible season that he had, Tyler did push it the title fight basically to two races to go. I mean, speaks volumes to to how good his season was as well. Um, you know, Tyler was Tyler Brewer was a very very consistent front runner this year. He had kind of made some progress toward the end of last season, like Goran did, and, and kind of continued to ramp things up throughout the year. Um, sounds like he might be running Pro Twins next year, which I think uh, could be a good fit, and he'd be he'd be very competitive in that class right away. Um, so, you know, shame to maybe lose an R1 on the Superbike grid, but uh, good to have another big name in uh, in Pro Twins. And then Tyrone Tavares, yeah. I mean, we only saw him kind of with a limited program. He did the Ontario rounds, uh, but he's definitely a Shannonville expert. I think that's fair to say. He yeah. won in round one. Um, I, I believe he finished second to Goran and then won in race two. Uh, and then in the finale, when Goran wasn't there, he, he kind of dominated the weekend. So, um you know, hard to envision him maybe doing the full slate as the pro, but he's a guy that would be, uh, you know, it wouldn't be too shocking if we rock up to Shannonville in the future and uh, and he's very, very competitive in pro superbike. You mentioned some of the rumors around Tyler Brewer and pro twins and things going on next year. I, is it fair to say that for next year, pro twins currently leads all of Bridgestone CSBK in terms of rumors? Oh, everyone you talk to is getting a twin. It's at this point, Ben Young and Alex Duma are going to be running in the twin class next year. I, you know, Valentino Rossi is coming out of retirement to run a twin. I don't know. It's uh, which you know again speaks volumes to how I think fun that class is, and we'll get to yeah. that uh, a little bit later. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I, uh, everybody that I talked to at Shannonville was just like, yeah, twin program coming together. I'm like. Really, huh? Because the other 18 people I talked to all said the exact <laughs> same thing, right? So uh, we'll see where that goes. But let's get into the EBC Breaks uh, Amateur Sport Bike Championship. Uh, the most intimidating name when you aren't familiar with it. And this is very similar to me calling French Canadian names in football, where you begin and it's like uh, you, uh, Matthew Garon Gauthier or something like that. And I'm like, originally, you're like, how am I going to spit this out live on air, like as the bullets are flying? But let me tell you what, Laurent Liberté Girard, by the end of the year, it was easy to say your name because he went to work time after time after time. Serge Boyer ended up finishing just four points back. They had a great battle, and Denny Jaguer finished off in third spot there. And then Jeff Barner, we got to give him a shout. Zyme Laflamme as well in fifth. Uh, and there were plenty of other names that popped in and won races, like uh, Andrew Alcampado uh, that was back at Grand Bend, who I know is a member of SOAR. Uh, he ended up winning the, the first race that they had on the Saturday in this class. Uh, and then at CTMP, the second race as well, went to Nolan Edie. So uh, there were lots of talented people that were involved in amateur sport bike this year. But Laurent Le Liberté Girard is the one who takes it home. Yeah, uh, well, I speak French about as well as I can probably run a marathon. So you're <laughs> uh, you're not alone there. And I apologize for butchering anybody's name in this this podcast. But yeah, Laurent Le Liberté Le 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 Oh, my. you, you threw me it. off. <laughs> so I thought it was Le Libert Girard. You threw me off. Le, Le Liberté Girard. There that's we go. what, that's what I've been going with. Him... I just love yogurt. That's my problem. Everyone calls him LLG, and I yes. actually kind of – I like the nickname, but I feel bad that no one actually uses his real name. So I'll, I'll try and power through. There you go. 
um him and Serge Boyer oh my god what a season and it's it really like the cliche all the cliches it came down to the wire you know every second counts it's yeah. every point counts all of them were true like when anybody says oh every second counts no one's going to roll their eyes and, and know that that's true more than and Serge Boyer and uh and Laurent um yeah four points covering them but I mean, the story of the last four races in this class, they kind of went back and forth early in the year. Uh, it looked like Laurent might be sort of the favorite early on. And then Serge kind of had this mid-season, uh, you know, climb up the standings. And he was putting some some really strong results together. And, and Laurent was kind of stuck in a rut. Uh, and then at, at CTMP, obviously, Serge Boyer had the disqualification for a fuel issue and um, you know, I don't, I don't think that was anything malicious or that he intended anything. I, I, I think from what I've heard that it was just an unfortunate, you know, the tank wasn't drained from the, the Thursday track day and there was a, a bad mixture, but you know, at the end of the day, rules are rules. And, uh, and then from there going into the finale, I, I mean, you, you can't put any asterisks on what, uh, on what our boy LLG put together because he wins in, in race one, he gets another podium in race two after a really incredible battle but even going into the last race both these guys had a real good shot of the championship uh search boy was leading by three points uh he had the tiebreaker and at one point with a couple of laps to go it looked as though serge boyer was going to win the championship off a tiebreaker which we were all scrambling has that ever happened before <laughs> I, I don't think that we've ever and you know, thankfully we didn't have to dig through the, the history books uh because laurent was able to pick up a, a position at the end um but yeah what ultimately cost the, the championship for boy which is you know, incredible for us i don't know he's probably going to hate me for rehashing this uh on Saturday, he finished third by one one thousandth of a second. That's point zero zero one uh, by second place. And ironically, no, I'm not ironically. Unfortunately, uh, those four point four points that he would have got for second place would have given him the championship. Oh, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? How close that was all the way down. As you say, four points finishing it off at the end. And uh, yeah, I also when you mentioned Serge Boyer, obviously with the DQ, it was also Vincent Wilson and Nolan Eady, uh in that race, which means. Ryan Beatty storms to victory in amateur sport bike, right hopping on that thing, and then kind of pops up on the top step, and he's like, yeah, I don't know what's going on. Weird, weird day. Yeah, I remember uh, I didn't hear about the disqualification. I remember seeing Ryan on the podium. I, I, I thought I would have remembered that, and then I you know, I heard that all three guys got disqualified for fuel issues, and it was, yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a bit of a confusing day, but you know, probably not the last time we'll see Ryan on a, a sport bike podium. I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, talking a little bit more about, uh, about Laurent the Liberté Girard, um, the sense I've got this year without having a lot of full conversations with him is that this, this is obviously his first year with CSBK. This might only be about his second year racing. Uh, and if that's true to come out of this with an amateur sport bike championship, uh, you know, I think he would say by his own admission, he's got a lot of work to do. There was you know, some issues kind of midway through the year at some tracks that he wasn't familiar with. But for him to already be going pro, uh, he's, I think, 20 years old in you know, a couple of years of racing, that's a scary sight for for what he could be in a while. Yeah, and now he joins in pro sport bike, like the whole host of crazy, young, talented up-and-comers that we have once again. We just throw another one onto the fire, right? And Laurent is a, is a smaller guy, too. So it's the idea of like, okay, so what machinery will he be on moving forward? And he did this all, by the way, on, on what I believe was his birthday weekend uh, because yeah. he, he gave my son Noah some Pop Rocks. Uh, and uh, which Noah immediately put in his mouth and then looked like he was going to start bawling because he didn't understand the explosion <laughs> uh, that was happening from the candy in his mouth. But they, I mean, they were in a great mood all weekend, obviously, and celebrating the final round in a successful year, regardless of how it ended. But it happens to end with the championship, as you say. And then what comes next for him is is really interesting because he's so new to all of this. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, in, in football terms or hockey terms or whatever, when you're talking about a prospect, you'd say they're, you know, maybe a little bit raw, you know, maybe got some tools that they got to work out, but the long-term potential is is off the charts. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. He's, you know, and, and I don't mean that, I mean that in a complimentary way that yeah. he's, uh, you know, to still be kind of working through some things halfway through the year and you don't really know the tracks that you're going to and still come out of all of that with a championship in your, your debut season, an amateur sport bike championship um, is, is yeah, really, really uh, remarkable.
Totally, totally. Uh, let's move on here to the importations. Tebow Pro Am Twins, as we mentioned, uh, to be <laughs> to be having this basically shake out the the way that it did by the end of the season. Uh, there were all sorts of storylines, all sorts of fun. Uh, Dallas Reynolds had a fantastic year, goes on to win the pro part of the Pro-Am here in the Importations Tebow Pro-Am Twins. Uh, J.P. Taché comes in second. Craig Atkinson uh, drops in third. Justin Marshall, shout out to him, came in fourth as well after a really strong start to the season and then a uh, difficult ending to it all. But uh, And then, I mean, J.F.'s here at the end. He ends up bombing in and finishing in sixth overall in the in the pro uh, of the Pro-Am Twins. And then on the amateur side, it was Sebastian Silva uh, that finished things off and won by 26 points, uh, the differential between him and Vincent Wilson, uh, who obviously DNF at CCMP in race one, then uh, did not compete in the second race, and then he was out due to injury in the final round. So Vincent could have had a good shot at that thing. But um, what what are your uh, your thoughts? What will you remember the, uh, the Pro-Am Twins for in 2024? Uh, well, I mean, the, you look at the names that we have in this class already. We're talking about all the rumors for 2025, but I mean, you had JP Taché, he was a former pro superbike rider. Uh, you know, Jody Christie did a couple of races. Yeah. JF Sear came out at the end of the season. He's a, a multi time winner. Uh, Bryce DeBoer is a national champion who, who just turned pro. Um, and yet, through all of it, Dallas Reynolds just kept plugging along, kept finding his way onto the podium against all these juggernauts that he faced. Never won a race. Like, yeah, and that's right? never so, won a race, won the championship because it was third, 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 second, 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 third, DNF, third, third. Like when you when you piece together a championship without winning, that tells you how much you stuck to it and found a way. Yeah, it might be the first guy ever to be kind of mad about getting a, a championship because he was, <laughs> and you know, this is a credit to the character that he has. He was, uh, he was, you know, kind of well, I don't know if I deserve it because I didn't win a race and blah blah blah. You know, if you're a champion, you're a champion and you yeah. deserve it. It's a long season. Are we MotoGP with 20 races? No, but it's still a long season. And like Goran said, you know, we referenced earlier, you go through so much. He faced, you know, le- legitimate talent. Like Jody Christie's a four time sport bike champion and a, a Canada Cup winner. And, you know, JFC here won races and JP Taché was, you know, a strong super bike rider. Like, it's not like he showed up to a club race and you know kind of did well, like no disrespect to that setting, but I'm saying like he earned this championship. Absolutely. You know, Kiki Rosberg, I believe was an F1 champion without winning a race. You, know, you look at, at the record books, it still shows him in the same way as everyone else. And so uh, obviously you like the humility from, from Dallas for sure, but I got to think that wins coming. He, uh, you know, it's not like he backed his way into fourths and fifths and and came out with the points. Like he was regularly on the podium. He was regularly near the front. Uh, first ever Aprilia champion, as far as I can tell, in CSPK S3, which is you know pretty cool. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it, this was a wide open fight. It was three or four guys that were in it, but you got to give credit where it's due. That Dallas, uh, you know, even if he's a little shaky, I, I think to the outside world, I think everyone would try to convince him that it was a pretty incredible year. And as you mentioned, Aprilia there, um, one of the the many rumors floating around is that there are going to be more Aprilia involved in uh, in Pro Am Twins coming out next year. I actually asked uh, Scott Miller, of course, who works on the Economy Lubin Ducati, uh, sorry, Economy Lubin Tire Ducati team with Alex Duma throughout the year, if there was a bike, and I said, not even for you to work on, like if there's just a bike that you would like to see in Superbike to be up here and to be competing and to be interesting and to mix up the grid and all the rest, because I'm like, we got the Cowies, like we got Suzuki when you got people like Trevor Daly coming around on the grid. You got, you know, the, uh, the Yamaha when Tommy Cassis comes on here, you got the Honda with David McKay, you got, uh, you know, the BMWs all over the place, obviously on and on and on you go. And I said, well, what's the one that you would love to see be on in, without even flinching? Scott Miller's just like Aprilia. He's like, we, it would be really cool to see Aprilia. Do you think that they could build momentum through twins and be able to find a rider or two to put a team eventually through this venue into something, whether it be more competitively in sport or super? I hope so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we obviously all hope so. I mean, it's a, it's a big package to take on for sure. Like another Italian brand that seems to be making a comeback. Um, but, you know, the last time we saw it, it was extremely competitive. Every time we've seen it in CSK, it's an extremely competitive bike. And it's just cool. I mean, let's yeah. face it, an Aprilia is cool. And, uh, and so I'd love to see it back uh, at the front of the regular, you know, pro classes but i guess it's you know not really eligible for sport bike but yeah. you know what i mean 
Um, but yeah, I mean, you look at it in, in twins and that RS660 package, they locked out the podium the last two rounds. Uh, it, everyone that rides that bike seems to love it. Uh, and you know, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of major issues, recurring issues with them. So it's clearly a competitive package. And and like I said, it's cool. I mean, Aprilia's are just, if you're the Honda guy, maybe I'm the Aprilia guy. I don't know. <laughs> you don't, you don't have enough Aprilia t-shirts to make it work yet, but we'll work I on that. Continue. Yeah, we'll work on that. We'll get, we'll get in touch with some people for sure. But uh, let's move on to the, uh, speaking of manufacturers, uh, let's move on to the Niagara Race Crafters. Oh, in- whoa, 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 whoa. You got amateur go twins. Oh, okay, sorry. I thought you already went down amateur. My bad. Go ahead. My bad. Apologies, Sebastian Silva. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this was another championship that came down to uh, kind of the last day, but in unfortunate circumstances. Uh, you know, Vincent Wilson kind of looked like the guy that was controlling it for most of the year, and and he paddled through a lot. He, uh, of course, had that crash in, in Radtorf that sort of banged him up, but he fought through it and uh, kept persisting. Looked like he was going to have the thing basically wrapped up at Chanaville, and then uh had another unfortunate crash at ctmp which ended his year he showed up at at shannonville hoping to ride and the doctors had to tell him you know you're going to do some serious damage to your body if you do this so we're not going to kind of clear you and so that unfortunately opened up uh well, unfortunately for him but fortunately for sebastian opened up a, a very big opportunity for silva to win the amateur championship but you know, again, uh, you've got to give credit where it's due. He finished races. He was regularly near the front. He was competitive. Uh, you know, he he made, you know, the full trip. And, you know, Sebastian's obviously a deserving champion as well. I mean, what's the quote to finish first? First, you have to finish. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, also I think Sebastian, or sorry, Vincent's um, season is kind of a, a wrap-up point to Dallas Reynolds where you could say, you know, won a lot of races but he probably trade those wins for a championship very quick yeah it's so true because like we were saying about dallas reynolds like not winning a, a race and winning the championship for vincent he won what was it here the first seven of the first eight races yeah. like like th- and crashed <laughs> out of the lead and then right I like the, crashed out of the lead and uh, ctmp or near the lead right so it's like he easily could have won essentially the first nine races of the year because he won seven of the first eight and uh, and then that one, obviously, in, in the first race, the Saturday at CTMP. So, and then you go through that, you're injured, you can't race in the final three, and all of a sudden, your points advantage just totally slips into the distance, right? So, uh, tough ending to the year, certainly in that spot. But that's Julia uh, Kranz too won the last three races. Of, there, uh, you there you amateur go, amateur friends. Shout crushed it. Okay, can we move? Can we move on? Now to... we can move on. Okay, to okay. The, okay. The N- N- Niagara asked, uh, Race Crafters Ninja ZX4 RR Cup. Uh, I I pestered him as did you to make sure that that thing looked the right way by the time that he got to SMP uh, number two, Electric Boogaloo. And sure enough, Mac Wheel and the Cowie showed up with a number one plate. Yeah, I got a bone to pick with the uh, the wheels because I suggested <laughs> after Shuby that they should run the number one plate. And no, nah, no, you know, I don't think we're going to. And then a certain Marshall Ferguson says they should run the number one plate and suddenly they show up with one. So tell you what, you, you go have coffee in Keene, Ontario with Mike wheel and things <laughs> just happen. You know, the, the wheels uh, of, of change start to spin. I'll, I'll remember that. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, Mac wheel is, is really, I mean, what can you say other than he, he absolutely dominated it? And it was, you know, let's call a spade a spade. It was a weaker grid. It's the first year of a spec class that's always going to be difficult in terms of getting bikes on the grid but you have to beat whoever you face and he absolutely decimated pretty much the whole season uh, he did kind of get beat outright by amateur uh, jean pascal schroeder at the end of the season um, but i think mac had sort of realized you know he had the number one plate uh, you know, there's no need to push he, he actually crashed out of the lead in one race and yeah. uh, con- and congrats to um I-, I believe dave walker won that race but um yeah, I mean, every, every other race that Mac competed in, he won the pro split. Uh, he won a lot of those outright over the amateur field. Uh, and again, you want to talk about cool bikes. I mean, if you're on the fence about buying a ZX4, those might be some of the coolest bikes in the paddock. Dude, so yeah. this is the other thing that probably helped uh, put the one plate on Mac Wheel's bike. They let me take their their like basically spare bike, like almost like a parts bike that is a ZX4R. And I took it for a spin like up and through the hills in and around Keene and Peterborough. And it just screams. Yeah. <laughs> and I knew it did from being around the track all year, but then you get on it and I'm like, 
I'm literally riding it like on a front. It was funny too because at the at the wheels house, there's a gravel road, and so I'm like tiptoeing all the way down because I'm like, okay, this isn't my bike, and I gotta be nice to it and all the rest. And then I hit the actual like main road, and I kind of like take off. I'm like, ah, oh, I want to put up through the gears and hear it sing because I know how good it sounds when I'm watching it at the track. And when I came back. Mike goes, yeah, I was really worried you weren't actually going to enjoy it because I, I kind of heard it go like all the way down to the driveway. And then he's like, and then I heard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like he goes, I heard it going through. He's like, oh, OK, no, we're good. We're good because it actually sounded like it's supposed to. When I first heard uh, Mac will do a practice start at Grand Bend, I thought Joe Roberts had shown up with a Moto2 <laughs> bike or something. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, it is. It is very cool. And and. So what are you hearing, Cam, in terms of it being a larger grid, in terms of being like, I don't want to say more competitive, but there being a greater uh, depth of field, I think, which is important for this series to accomplish moving forward. And I really do hope that people will see and hear that bike and go, ah, maybe that is for me. Maybe I do want to compete in that. I think a lot of it is the word of mouth. It's a very new bike. So yeah. people don't, you know, didn't know a lot about it at the start of the year and uh, they were a little bit unsure of how the class was going to go. But I think now... Uh, having a year to kind of see how the product went and you hear the stories from Mac and, you know, from the like uh, Adolfo Silva, who's the father of Sebastian Silva, yep. uh, you know, got the bike and loves it. And, uh, you know, uh, Hervé Remeter, who helps out a, a whole bunch of, you know, uh, Quebec guys in the paddock, he, he got a bike and loved it. Like everybody loves their class. And, um, yeah, McFadden. You know, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it seems to be, you know, for the guy, the people that are contested in it, they love it. So I, I think that word of mouth is the big thing. Uh, you know, people maybe just need to get a year to kind of see how things go and hopefully we'll have some deeper grids next season. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and to wind things down here in our uh, Cam Bickle pod, Supersonic Road Race School, Pro-Am Lightweight, which was so much fun on Saturday at CTM, or uh, sorry, at, uh, at Shannonville. I just want to say before we like talk about the actual results of anything, I might have enjoyed that race more than any that I've enjoyed in probably the last, I don't know, two or three rounds. Like it was so much fun to watch the competition at the top end there because like seeing (laughs) Stacey Nesbitt going to work, but also seeing like, whether it was Jacob Black, Jerry McKinnon, like there was people all over the place in the pro category. But to me, it was honestly like seeing Ryan Beatty climbing and there was a battle between Cole Alexander and Treston Morrison in that race on the Saturday, that was one of the best in any class at any CC, any manufacturer. I think we've had the entire year. Oh yeah. I mean, the, the kids that really came out to, to fight in this class for sure. I, I was mean... sitting at the end of the back straight and every single time they came down, I'm just like, that's not possible. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. They made it work. That's good. Everybody's okay. Yeah, there's a lot of people kind of clenching and looking away on pit lane, and then you know they realize you know, everything's okay. They're like, "Oh my god, that was incredible!" Which is <laughs> yeah. what that class is supposed to be, right? Like we don't have a you know, Moto Three system in in Canada, but this is what this class is supposed to be. Is something like that, and uh, you know the kids they they came up. I say the kids. You know, Brian Beatty is 15. Justin uh, uh, Morrison's 14. Um, obviously, Bailey Ives a little bit old by their standards, but you know compared to the rest of us, is still a young guy um they had a, a phenomenal year and ryan obviously is the story he's the champion uh and a guy that we think has a bright future in, in canada obviously won his uh his only amateur sport bike race this year by you know, a bit of bizarre circumstances but still a win is a win and um yeah at Tristan morrison is, is i think a big big story came on late um we saw him in rad torque and then he did the last couple of rounds in ontario uh, like I said, 14 years old, and he was a graduate of the mini GP system last year. So we got a little bit familiar with him and um, kind of what I talked about with uh, LLG earlier, someone that I think needs some coaching, um, but the, the talent that's there is absolutely off the charts. Yeah, won't be able to uh, to be denied for very long. And uh, before we end up wrapping this thing up, you talk about the mini GP system uh, and the development of it and how everything has been going. I just want to give a shout out because I was uh, brought into the supersonic road race school, uh, environment for the first time up at Lombardi. Uh, and it, it was very, very cool. It was an awesome experience to be able to get up there. Uh, but I'm trying to remember Lincoln Scott, uh, and Jaeger Stockel are the two that will be going over to Valencia, I believe right at the end of November. Um, I got to see them compete against each other. And when we talk about like the young kids showing up here in the supersonic road race school, like pro am lightweight, 
to see these two just absolutely rip back and forth on each other and force the issue into every single corner when we were up in Lombardi a couple of weeks ago. It kind of gives you hope that, yeah, there is more coming down the pipeline, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, th- those two kids look very, very talented. Uh, Lincoln, the champion, and and Jagger, the runner-up. Both of them will go to uh, Valencia alongside the last MotoGP round for the FIM Mini GP final. Yeah. Uh, is... Should mention quickly before we get yeah. cut off here in the next minute and a half, uh, the pro side of uh, yes. Lightweight as well, yeah. Gary McKinnon. Uh, the oldest rider in the paddock and the champion. So hats off to Gary. Uh, doesn't know if he's going to do the full slate next year, which will be a loss for all of us. Um, but uh, Gary's had an incredible career. Uh, and Stacey Nesbitt uh, showed up at the end of the season, did the last couple of rounds. She was the champion a year ago, I believe. And um, yeah, it's just an incredible finish. She was battling with Tristan Morrison, which was uh, really, really fun to see. And uh, that class has a, a bright future as well. Agreed. Agreed. And I, uh, I genuinely hope Gary does the full schedule because nothing makes me happier than seeing Gary just like riding his bike around the track or like even in the paddock area kind of thing. And you go up and he says something quirky and fun and East coasty. And then he just goes out and kicks ass on a bike. Like he's just yeah. that dude, right? He's always been that dude. So, uh, awesome. Good stuff, Kim. I appreciate you, uh, being able to break this all down for everybody. Let everybody know where they can find everything you're doing around CSBK. Uh, on csbk.ca there's going to be a lot more content than usual out this winter is the goal uh, obviously juggling two or three jobs makes that a little bit yep. difficult um, but uh, yeah going to try and have something out uh, at least every few weeks or every month and uh, check it out on the website and then I'm just going to speak this into fruition was anyone Daytona. supposed to hear that oh Daytona Daytona let's go to Daytona again 